Tak sama juga lah. Okay. Okay, actually, thank you juga lah. Uh, give me this opportunity to give a present, uh, to present the webinar for today. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Dr. Visa. So uh, I, I think it's, uh, I need to really call, uh, uh, introduce again uh, also. Uh, um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. So uh, now we are going to Mr. Ragunath Kandasamy presentation. Uh, he is the head of neurosurgery clinical KL. He did his undergraduates in UM and completed his postgraduate and qualified as neurosurgeon in USM 2012. So he completed a number of uh, fellowship program and at world renowned centers and uh, he's qualified in, uh, call in a few subspecialty, super specialty here. So from JCMT Fellowship in Pituitary and Hypothalamic Surgery, 2014 Spine Fellowship, 2016 in Royal Adelaide, Australia, and Fellow uh, of American College of Surgeons, uh, 2021. He's a lecturer at the Department of Neuroscience, U USM, and has been involved in many research and publications of journals and books in neurosurgical field. So uh, we are really honored to have him today. Uh, uh, he will be sharing with us an update on non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. But Mr. Ragunath, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ashraf, for that very kind introduction. Uh, we had a nice lecture this morning, the first session on headache and its relation to how you guys manage in the emergency department. I imagine it's quite a daunting task, uh, you know, trying to sift through all the patients that you see and deciding who actually needs to be investigated. I mean, across the years, we all have our little things that we do in order to not miss things. But I do agree sometimes, unfortunately, some, some patients do slip through the gap. Now, okay, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage is a very extensive topic. We can probably have a weekend symposium on it. Because there are so many aspects, uh, you know, that need discussion. But perhaps I will try to put things together, you know, you know in a very simple format because a lot of young doctors here. Now, SAH is basically bleeding between the pyre and arachnoid layers of the brain. Okay, what is the commonest cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage? It still remains to be trauma, right? But when it occurs in a spontaneous setting, then 85% is uh, due to an aneurysm rupture. Uh, other things that can cause SAH other than aneurysm rupture is can, an AVM, a dural uh, or a fistula, venous thrombosis, you know. These are also things that can manifest with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, uh, you know, in the lesser proportion. Now, it is a generally, especially when it's aneurysmal in etiology, it's a devastating disease, you know. It's not just affecting the brain, there's multi-system involvement now, and the mortality, initial mortality is about 20%. That means about one-fifth of patients don't reach the hospital. And of those who actually get here, you know, there's a 30-day mortality of nearly 45 to 50%. So, of, you know, and a third of the survivors of who actually survive will be, be may, uh, remain in a caregiver-dependent state. This is usually if it's a diffuse, severe subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, from an aneurysm rupture. And, uh, you know, we prognosticate patients usually based on the GCS score when they come in and the presence of neurological deficit. That's what our WFNS scoring system is all about. I, I will share that with you as we yeah, progress through the presentation. But uh, it's not all doom and gloom. I am sure you recognize some of these people here. They have uh, survived, uh, you know, brain aneurysms. So uh, I think detection, of course, makes a, a you know, very important role in everything. So what, I mean, SAH per se accounts about for about 3% of all the strokes that, you know, we see in practice. Uh, the important risk factors are similar to a lot of other, other strokes, high blood pressure, smoking, alcohol, and of course, if you have a first degree relative with subarachnoid hemorrhage, it really pushes up your risk. Now, in a, uh, you know, in a, when you look at from a world perspective, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage incidence in Malaysia is about three to four per 100,000 population. Uh, it's a bit less than what you see in the Western population, but, uh, you know, and of course, but compared to countries like Japan and Finland, where the rates are very much higher. I mean, we are somewhere in the middle. And the reason Japanese are predisposed is uh, it believed to be differences in their diet as well as the, you know, the, the constitution of their cerebral blood vessels. Uh, countries like Japan and Finland are actually where we get a lot of our information on managing uh, aneurysms, particularly because they have extensive screening programs to pick up uh, aneurysms way before uh, you know they rupture. Okay, so 
you know in, in a global perspective if you look you see that you know we southeast asia sound somewhere you know in the middle of the whole thing now malaysian data i think we've got some some of this data out of hospital sungai bulu a couple of years ago we found that the mean age of patients presenting in our population is around 48 with a which commonly affected males and those patients with hypertension and diabetes were the most common comorbidities that we were able to see uh i'm just going to step out a little bit from subarachnoid hemorrhage to describe what an aneurysm is basically it's an abnormal dilatation of the blood vessels in the brain uh why do you develop aneurysms it's a combination of a few factors it's uh, due to shearing force you know brought upon by turbulent blood flow as well as you know elevated blood pressure and intrinsic vessel wall weaknesses and or a combination of both there would be a bulge out of the blood vessel either in a segmental that means a secular formation or in the circumferential manner means the whole vessel wall dilates now i mean the risk factors to decay an aneurysm are very similar to the risk factors of in you know, subarachnoid hemorrhage so essentially it's a you know this it's a interrelated process but there are other conditions that you know, can also lead to uh, you know aneurysm development like a penetrating trauma or infective processes something we call um uh infective or uh you know aneurysms okay predominantly aneurysms affect the anterior circulation a bit more than the posterior circulation and common locations include the place where the arteries branch you know the anterior communicating artery the internal carotid artery pcom branch or the middle cerebral artery or sentinel hemorrhage that means before a major hemorrhage Uh, about two or three weeks prior you develop a severe headache uh, i mean uh, you develop a mild headache which is not so severe and usually sometimes the patients don't seek treatment or you know they don't get the typical thunderclap symptoms so what happens is they are brushed off as you know being just a mild you know not severe form of problem uh, alternatively sometimes you you know when you have a, a large aneurysm you can actually uh, predispose to turbulent blood flow clot formation and you know multiple tias last but not least sometimes you know when you have a giant aneurysm they can actually cause compression on structures like the brain stem and cranial nerve and they even you know present uh, in that way rather than you know the typical rupture and uh, incidental finding is also something that you know that we do see in practice but of course if you have a established screening program it is definitely going to be higher now yeah here's a classic example of a giant aneurysm and you know you know when you are yeah, when, uh, when you start practicing sometimes this, i mean i know of residents or young surgeons mistaking this to be a tumor and attempting to take it out with disastrous you know implications so so you see a large a large um, aneurysm like this especially in the skull base can significantly cause a lot of mass effect so a quick summary of uh, you know what are the key facts about brain aneurysm now one in uh, every one in 50 people you know has an unruptured brain aneurysm that's kind of high and every 18 minutes a brain aneurysm ruptures and the commonest risk factors i think i've already mentioned high smoking high blood pressure family history age over 40 uh use of recreational drugs and head injury all right quick sum up of that okay now in the emergency department headaches are i mean we have heard from your, your colleague just now headaches are such a common symptom so you can't be over investigating everybody but deciding who to treat you know is so important uh, and you know we don't want i mean in some publications they they have described it in the early days up to 25% misdiagnosis but i think in this current era we are looking at about 5% uh, you know di- uh, only 5% misdiagnosis which is you know in a reflection of how the quality of emergency care has improved um i think uh, you know differential diagnosis for sudden onset headache has been sort of covered in the prior prior uh, discussions but uh, yeah you know as i I'll probably just skip through that so for subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, you know we talked about earlier about thunderclap headache the worst headache in your life uh you know but i mean the problem sometimes happens if the patient also has a pre existing migraine or other chronic headache syndrome so you know changes in the nature of a headache are always one of uh, one point that i also try to take into account when i'm talking to a patient and you know when they giving me history of headache sudden onset severe you know and do remember of course sometimes mild headache milder headaches about 2 to 3 weeks prior could be a sentinel hemorrhage you know that means as a minor hemorrhage which is indicating the possibility that the aneurysm dome is unstable and it may rupture down the line 
a, a patient with a headache with sudden onset ptosis is uh, we sometimes I call it a spot diagnosis in neuro neurosurgery. You have to rule out a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. The vicinity of the posterior communicating artery to the third cranial nerve sets it up sets it up for this particular condition. So you have to remember this, right? Now. Very Disconnected, is it? Uh, it's not only yeah. me, right? Yeah. Okay. True, 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 Mr. Tashra. So we wait for Mr. Regu for a while. Can we text him in the group? Mm -hmm. Mr. Regu? Okay. I think he got disconnected. Disconnected. Okay. Yeah. The challenges of doing <laughs> online. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> but just to move it up. Okay, Mr. Agu is typing. So, yeah. Okay. All right, great. Okay, don't worry. So yeah, it's a call. Uh, it's very called interesting uh, topic, and yeah, I'm listening. Just now, yeah, I, I do learn a lot also. Uh, please type in your question uh, for the participants if you have any question. Mr. Ruku hasn't joined lagi kan? Belum, belum. Belum eh? Okay, can we yeah. just wait? Just wait. I was um, baffled to see dia punya picture just now. There was a very big like uh, calcified lesion over the um, uh, apa tu? Um, pituitary fossa area. I have had yeah. similar patient but I think they treated as SOL. But it was an elderly guy came in with yeah. a seizure. So, wow, it can be very huge. Eh? It can, it can. So we have a recent one, a 32 years old guy. Okay. With about three, four, uh, I think it's PCOM 2 or ACOM at least. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not ACOM, the, the ICA, near the ICA, okay. ICA. Okay. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, usually that something like that will be associated with collagen vascular disease uh, as a background. Um, I, I really see. Need to, okay. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Ego, right. yeah, you're in. <laughs> yeah. My apologies. No worries, no worries. Okay, let, let me just uh, restart as we are. Share screen. Uh, okay. So I was saying to you all, one of the problems that I noticed over the years uh, about you know, confidence in uh, picking up signs is because, uh, you know, one the young doctors sometimes are not confident with the examination techniques. And another thing is nobody looks into the funders enough. The optic funders can give you a lot of information. It is a skill that needs to be trained. Like uh, a simple thing in subarachnoid, you know, uh, about 30 people to see a subhyaloid hemorrhage like this. They call it a boat shaped hemorrhage in the retina. And sometimes there may be evidence of papilledema, dilated veins, but you have to look. You have to look. Some, you know, we give up too easily, especially when you start out, you know, oh, the lighting. Mr. Ego disconnected again, Kato. So it's not me, I don't, everyone, okay. Yeah, Mr. Ego is disconnected again. Yeah, sometimes, uh, even in KL, also things happen like this. <laughs> uh. So, yeah. So, yeah, this is a very nice image. I can still see, you all can see, right? The fundus. So while waiting for Mr. Regu, uh, connect again. Um, yeah, so now we cannot see the, the picture, picture just now. So I'll, yeah, 
because once upon the time when yeah stroke is so so busy so i was thinking yeah being a neuro ophthalmology is the better <laughs> occult uh because of uh yeah something like you can really appreciate one of the earliest presentation of a lot of neurological diseases so really look into the eye don't miss that yeah I, I I think lately, uh, because of COVID, kan, you don't want to go so near to the <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I use a lot of uh, apa tu, uh, optic ultrasound. Uh, it really helps. It helps. Uh, patient datang undifferentiated, blurry of vision. Everyone is blurry of vision. Kan? Even though you got optic ultrasound, also blurry of vision. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, by, by, by scanning the, the optic nerve, actually, it's quite... It's quite interesting lah. You can see the, you know, you see at the optic nerve diameter. So yeah, I mean, of course, it doesn't really give you the. Um, you may not be able to see the cotton wool hemorrhage. Uh, apa tu? All the other uh blood, uh, yeah. related finding. But in a way, gross abnormality. Inshallah, we detect. Um, uh, we have diagnosed like um vitreous um detachment those mm. kind of things yeah it, it does it does have and then you can see the pupil especially if the eye is very swollen kan? you yeah. can't see the other side of the eye I'm yeah Mr. Ego, Mr. Ego Mr. Ego is back <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry i don't know why suddenly the wi-fi is just acting up today you know uh, <laughs> just keeps dropping off my apologies i'm the hospital some more yeah <laughs> no problem <laughs> So, I mean, here, here I mean, I'll quickly come back so I don't want to lose your flow. See, some of these um, signs like, why is neck stiffness something so important in subarachnoid? When we have blood tracking down in, into the subarachnoid space and it enters into the spinal canal, it irritates the nerve roots. So, you know, other than meningitis, this is another, you know, subarachnoid with uh, neck stiffness is one of those things which you always get very worried about, you know, when a patient comes in with headache because that means something ominous is going on. So, and here, you know, the positive... Uh, I, LR also is quite significant in this case, you know. Uh, other things are like, um, I mean, vomiting is very non-specific. Even migraine, it may happen. But and of course, neurological deficit, photophobia also can be seen in SAH, right? And of course, as what was mentioned by our colleague earlier, onset of headache within one minute because that is, is essentially describing the whole process where the pressure builds up and boom, the aneurysm ruptures. So the, at that point, there's a severe, severe headache. So a, a lot has been spoken about the Ottawa SAH rule. Perhaps I would not waste too much time going on this. But you see, commonly, I, I mean, it's not easy. It's easy to be on the other end of things to say, oh, why you all didn't do a CT scan? And But I do understand in a well patient, you all have limited resources. You can't be investigating everybody, can we? So I think I won't step too much into this uh, that has been mentioned, but okay. Now, essentially, when a patient comes in with the headache that you think is due to a subarachnoid, what are the things we're trying to do? We one Number one, you need to confirm the presence of SH. Then only you go about, okay, to identify the aneurysm and then to figure out what needs to be done. Now, CT scan is was very easily utilized, you know, quick to be done, but it's very sensitive in the acute period. But as the days go by, the sensitivity starts to drop. I'll just move to the next slide. So now you see, it's very time dependent. You come in early, no problem. Likelihood of us picking up is higher. But as the days go by, by the time you get to the second week, it's only 30% sensitivity. And by the third week, the sensitivity is zero. And you do know patients, Malaysian patients sometimes just will take their time before they come in. And a lot of it also depends on the volume of blood, the type of scan and who's looking at it. So in the subacute period and MRI, particularly after four days, the sensitivity compared to a CT actually, you know, goes up to nearly 100%. In, and if you look at the T2 or flare images, so an MRI is an option, you know, in a subacute manifestation when you are not sure. But I do know that you can't be sending everybody for MRI. So that's where there is a role for something called the lumbar puncture. Uh, okay. So what do you look at when you're doing a lumbar puncture? So now, you see, a traumatic tap is something that does occur, you know, especially when you're doing it infrequently. Or even sometimes in the train hands, sometimes there's a vessel in the way. So you look for one xanthochromia, you know, hemosiderin uh, degradation products in the CSF. Number one, but if it's very acute, you may not see that much hemosiderin. You look for uniform blood staining. See, in a traumatic tap, if you're draining out CSF, the blood will become less in every serial, you know, 10 drops that you take. But if it's an acute subarachnoid, you're going to have this uniform blood staining. So this is another way for you to differentiate. 
Uh, all right, but mind you, never do an LP without doing a CT scan because what you don't want is a large ICB and you release CSF from below and you're in trouble. I mean, just in case suddenly you think, hey, no, la, don't do CT scan, we go straight to LP. Don't forget that. Huh? Old tenants. Okay, so when you're looking at a CT scan, I mean, the typical appearance of subarachnoid hemorrhage is within the cisternal region, you know, sometimes extending into the, the ventricles, brainstem, you know, the hound's fill you need is anything between 70 to 80. See, when you're not sure, especially in the skull base, you're not sure, is it bone? Is it partial voluming? You go down, you get the radiologist just point at the voxel and look at the hound's fill unit, no harm. All right. And you see, it tends to follow, follow this dentate pattern. It follows the sulci and gyri in, into the sulci, you see, like this in the interhemispheric feature. Now, and there's a whole spectrum. It could be just hardly anything which, you know, you really need to look for a little bit in the sylvian feature. You could have this star-shaped blood in the cisterns, which is typical. And of course, and there even may be an intracerebral bleed. And depending on the pattern, see a blur, bleed in the sylvian feature, we always think of an MCA aneurysm. Something more basal like this, uh, maybe an internal carotid artery uh, or a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. Uh, subdural sometimes can also be a manifestation of an aneurysm rupture, by the way, typically in an internal carotid artery aneurysm. And if there's a clot here in the, you know, the paramedian region, they call it the cingulate gyrus clot, this is typical of an anterior cerebral artery you know, aneurysm. So sometimes in, when we're training our neurosurgery residents, show them scans, say, where do you think the likely location of this bleed is, I mean, the aneurysm is, all right? No, so beyond just finding subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, you should also automatically, when you see SH, think, okay, is there some subhydrocephalus going on? Is there interventricular hemorrhage? Because this, you know, sort of translates to the treatment that the neurosurgeon is going to do. So if you call and say, hey, I have a patient, subarachnoid like this, WFNS grade like this, CT scan shows diffuse bleed, fissure grade, what? Uh, hydrocephalus going on? Wow, very impressive. And I, I do know quite a few of our ED colleagues have, you know, have got to this point. Sometimes there's a big intraparenchymal bleed that needs evacuation, you know. So understanding the emergent nature of this is you know, also very important. So here you can actually see beautifully, there's a large clot and when there's contrast given, you see the, the thing lights up. This is called a flip-flop sign, a radiological sign, you know, of a sign of a large aneurysm. Okay, now I want you all to look at this scan and tell me whether you can see anything. This is a case, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail, long time ago where patient was sent back, headache, you know, but he responded to medication. So he was sent back. Now remember, response to analgesia is not an indication that it's not severe, you know? So if you look very carefully, there is you know, gyriform subarachnoid in this patient, you know? And this patient actually had a, a small aneurysm that had ruptured. Now, to place this question, can a patient have a normal CT scan after clinical history and findings which are highly suggestive of SH and scan done within 12 hours? So, you know, this is the answer to, I mean, going back to what I just mentioned, never, you know, nevertheless, the, you know, even though thorough review that you don't find an aneurysm, you still cannot always be excluded, you know? Okay, so assuming you have done your assessment and you found out the aneurysm, then what do you do? Now we move on to modalities to confirm the presence of an aneurysm. Most widely utilized in practice these days is a CT angiogram. CT angiogram can be done fast. It gives you a nice reconstructed view. Uh, and it's uh, quite sensitive these days with the current, uh, you know, high coil, I mean, high, high slices available. Sometimes we need to do a DSA when, you know, it's one, number one CT is negative or you're not able to visualize the aneurysm clearly, right? Uh, and, you know, you, because if it may affect your decision making in terms of uh, the surgical approach or what technique of uh, treatment you're going to use. So then we do a DSA. Uh, when you do an aneurysm, I mean, an NGO study, what do you want to determine? You want to know the site of the aneurysm, which artery is affected, the size, the dome, the neck. There's a, some, something called the dome neck ratio, uh, uh, the aspect ratio that predicts, you know, pre re rupture and so on and so forth. The shape, whether it's fusiform, secular, you know whether there are any artery coming out from the dome, these are all surgical implications. Lah. And when you find more than one, we need to know which one has ruptured. Because from a neurosurgical perspective, you want to go after the one that has ruptured first. So the general tenant is the largest aneurysm or the one where you see something called a teeth sign or a nipple sign right on the apex of the aneurysm dome, there'll be a slight a little protrusion, which is, this is the point of rupture. So these are things you can look at or look for on an NGO. And of course, if there's focal vasospasm around a particular area where an aneurysm is located, that is 
more suggestive. It's not definitive, but more suggestive that that's where the bleed started. You know, because the blood products are maximal at that area. We also, when you're doing an NGO from a neurosurgical perspective, we want to know about the arterial tree. Is it a unilateral anterior cerebral artery? Is there cross flow? Because, you know, if you need to sacrifice an artery, we need to know which point, you know, is safe for that to be done. Uh, this is what a CT angiogram looks like when you do a reconstructed view. You see, you can actually overlay with the skull base because that helps us in our surgical planning. This is the very first aneurysm I clipped in Kuching many, many years ago. So I've always kept this image during my teaching slides. Here's an angiogram. Now, if you look at this angiogram, yeah, you know, AP view, lateral view, you can't really make out much. But if you look very carefully, sometimes you'll be able to pick up things. So remember, you have to, in order to a complete angio, is an angio that demonstrates flow through both internal carotid artery with blood crossing through the anterior communicating artery, as well as through the vertebral artery and posterior circulation. You must be able to see flow through both posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. So sometimes if you find an NGO is negative, you have to make sure that the NGO is done in you know, great detail. I know a lot of the interventional radiologists and radiologists are well trained, but you know, from a resident's perspective, this is the So we've talked a little bit about symptomatology and investigation. I will move towards uh, management now. Can you, I hope you can hear me. My internet connection is showing me problems. All right. So after the initial assessment done in the a &E, right, uh, we move on to imaging, uh, depending on which is necessary. And once the SAH is confirmed, there's a whole list of things that you need to sort out. The baseline blood test, you do grading and scoring of severity, which I'll share in the next slide. Uh, of course, emergent neurosurgical consult, things that we can do down there in the ED. So you can you know, took into your seizure prophylaxis, anticoagulation reversal, if there's any, or antiplatelet reversal, uh, control pain, control blood pressure, and, you know, emergent, when there's a deterioration in GCS, usually um, we sometimes have to perform an immediate surgical procedure to relieve intracranial pressure. It is not about, uh, you know, solving the aneurysm that has ruptured, but just reducing the pressure. So, Bringing you back to what is known as the WFNS, World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies Grading Scheme, or Hunt and Hess. These are the two most commonly used uh, scales of assessment. I feel WFNS is easier simply because it's based on GCS. Uh, Hunt and Hess is very wordy and all. Uh, to be fair, I think you know if you're going to choose, remember one, you can use this. There are other grades, Botterell and all this, but what is easily replicatable is what is ideal. So WFNS grades hinges on your GCS score you know, whether it's full or 13 to 14 with or without deficit. So motor deficit can be limb deficit, can be cranial nerve deficit. And of course, uh, when you go into the lower grades, seven to 12, three to six, uh, you know, they are automatically grade four and grade five. Now, remember the survival uh, prognosis is essentially hinged on the WFNS grade. And you know, in grade five, sometimes the survival is only 10% and grade four is only 20%. So this is why sometimes in you know very busy neurosurgical center, you got no ICU bed, sometimes you have to make a decision. But remember one thing, before you decide that the patient is grade five, nothing can be done. If there's a reversible cause for the unconsciousness, meaning there's hydrocephalus or there's a large blood clot compressing on the brain, it needs to be sorted out first before you, you, you grade them according to WFNS grade. This is an important thing that people tend to forget sometimes. Because sometimes it's just putting an EVD and they wake up and they are salvageable. So, you know, uh, error uh, sometimes done by, uh, you know, young, young neurosurgical residents. Okay, so once we have restrictified them, our initial management. Now, subarachnoid hemorrhage should be managed in an ICU without a doubt, and in preferably in a high volume neurocenter. That means they see at least 35 cases of SAH per year. I mean, of course, uh, I'm not, uh, things are different in Malaysia. La. We know, may not always have a high volume center, but I think the biggest centers, most of them are quite competent, you know, to be able to handle this. Even in private, I see at least three aneurysms a month. All right. Now, simple tenets of management, uh, maintain U volumia, not hypervolumia, especially in an unsecured aneurysm. Just want to make sure they're well hydrated, you know, good cerebral perfusion, good analgesia, blood sugar monitoring, glycemic control is a hinge, important point in any brain pathology. It's found to be a you know, class one evidence that, you know, it improves outcome because brain needs glucose, especially under stress. Um, you can use anti-epileptic medications, especially in the acute phase. Uh, I know this is, there are some arguments on this, but imagine if you have a seizure with a patient in a, with an aneurysm, it can re-rupture and that can be disastrous. So I generally find that using anti-epileptics is a, you know, it's a safer option. 
uh, nimodipine. Nimodipine is the calcium channel blocker. Now, while it it's supposed, it's nothing to do with actually uh, hypertension per se. It's just it's a cerebrospecific calcium channel blocker. So they have found that it actually improves neurological outcome in SAH. Why? Because ischemia, which is one of the things that happen in SAH, is uh, mediated through calcium. So something called calcium mediated cytotoxicity. Through that, they find that by suppressing calcium channel, I mean, using calcium channel blockers, the outcome is better. It doesn't do anything to the actual vasospasm process, but you know, this is the only drug that there's strong evidence. Other than that, BP control, you titrate down the BP, you know, to, you know, to maintain CPP. Like, this is ideal in the ICU setting. Keeping it below 160 is quite reasonable. No need to be so accurate. I know the interact trial showed acute reduction doesn't cause significant uh, drop. But let me point out something. In uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, there's vasospasm going on, you know. And treatment of vasospasm is hypertension. So that's why, uh, you know, in un unsecured, I'll, around 160, 150, I'm quite okay. But in post, uh, in, in secured aneurysms, I sometimes let the BP just go up to 180, 200. It's fine. That's the body trying to reset it, making sure the brain gets enough oxygen in spite of spasm. So, you know, yes, there are guidelines, but uh, you know, there are a lot of little things that we you know titrate and monitor accordingly. Uh, beyond that, uh, ulcer prophylaxis is quite standard. Stress ulcers can occur commonly in uh, subarachnoid. Patients with poor GCS be intubated, and of course, as I've mentioned earlier, EVD if there's hydrocephalus or take out the clot first, and then only decide on definitive planning. Uh, and okay, then determination of final treatment plan. Okay, once you've done all this acute initial management, it comes to the issue of what to do with the aneurysm. Okay, there's this whole summary of recommendations. I will share the slides with you all. I don't want to, you know, just go through, but this is essentially what the current uh, uh, guidelines are. Okay, before I just talk about how we're going to handle the aneurysm, these are common complications of SAH that cause a lot of problems in neurological ones and non-neurological. Okay, when you have SAH, blood goes into the ventricular system, it blocks the flow, you get hydrocephalus, it causes deep um, intracranial hypertension. Similarly, when blood is out of the blood vessel, the hemosiderin and the content of blood irritates the cerebral blood vessels and initiates a process called vasospasm. This is the cause of delayed deterioration in patients. Actually, one of the reasons, you know, you, mortality is so high. Beyond that, I'll talk about vasospasm a little bit more. Rebleeding and CGS. These are the common neurological conditions that we have to sort out acutely. But when you have an aneurysm rupture, there's a release of a large amount of catecholamines into the systemic system. And they result in things like cardiac dysfunction, myocardial dysfunction, you can get acute pulmonary, neurogenic pulmonary, pulmonary edema, ARDS, you get electrolyte imbalances, you know, endocrine deficiency, you can even get central fever if the, the, the subarachnoid and the bleed is near the hypothalamus. So that's why, you know, ICU care, a couple of weeks is quite a common thing, even in well patients, right? Rebleeding is what we're always very worried about. So in, on the first day, the rebleeding rate is 15%. But by the first month, it can is up to forty percent cumulatively. But then it sort of tapers down, you know, to three percent per year after six months. Um, okay. Now I'm going to go into aneurysm and treatment principles. Now, what is the once we have done all this initial stabilization, we aim to treat the aneurysm. How you want to prevent it from rebleeding, and you know, of course, that will facilitate the treatment of other things like keeping the BP high for vasospasm and so on and so forth. There are all these things I'm going to talk about. Surgery, endovascular therapy, and combination treatments. Okay, so okay, I think this graphic will sort of highlight the point. When you have a, a area of focal weakening on your vessel wall, normal flow, BP picks up, boom, aneurysm ruptures. So our treatment goal is to completely occlude the aneurysm and isolate it from the parent vessel, but not without I mean or with making sure we don't obliterate the flow through the parent vessel because then you're going to have an ischemic stroke. So. This is what an aneurysm clip, you know, over a base of the uh, artery looks like. So, you know, in, in this graphic, you see the aneurysm clip, there's no blood going into the aneurysm. So, it flow can continue. Who are common candidates for clipping? If the aneurysm is secular, that means there is a neck where you can apply a clip. You know, or if the aneurysm involving the anterior circulation in good, great patients, young patients, uh, those who there's a large clot which you have to take out anyway, sometimes we can even clip it straight away. And of course, in Malaysia, I have to use put number six, like availability of endovascular facilities. Unfortunately, it's not always available everywhere. And surgery is best done early nowadays. Though there was a time they'll say, wait for 10 days, patient survive, then we operate, but no more. It's early surgery, within 24 to 48 hours to reduce the risk of rebleeding, 
to settle the vessels spasm by washing out the cerebral systems of blood and you know but the challenge sometimes early surgery brain swelling lah okay so i give you i mean to make it more interesting i'm going to show you a video illustration of a 36 year old lady she had history of recurrent headaches 3 weeks prior she was at you know admission admitted and uh, for migraine but you know the initial mri was absolutely normal on her third admission gcs drops to 8 and at that time there was a diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage so this was a case of a central hemorrhage uh, you know even though in, uh, mri was done perhaps you know do it, once you get to a 3 week time frame sometimes you can miss things so she had an acom aneurysm on the ct angio this is a video of the i mean how the clipping is done okay so this is the aneurysm up here this is the anterior cerebral artery on the left on the right and this below here on the arrow is the anterior communicating artery so first thing is usually we have to dissect and free you see how red and swollen this thing is just waiting to be clipped so once we have identified the neck then we move on to actually place the clip so this is uh, so once we have dissected it clear free uh, i'm sorry i'm moving to the next slide yeah okay and this is how you know once it's dissected we this is how the clip placing the clip over the aneurysm looks like So you see, you have to go slow because if you are too fast, you can actually <laughs> rupture and create a hole in the parent artery. Yeah. So this is how uh, clipping looks like properly. Okay. Here's another case. This 66-year-old man collapsed at home. I remember it was uh, pre-Christmas. I had to come back in. His chest was initially 13, but dropped to 8 because of hydrocephalus. Also, another acom aneurysm. I uh, used a slightly different approach, an eyebrow approach. You can see this. This is the aneurysm dome up here. Yes, the anterior cerebral artery, and you know there's a lot of clot stuck to it, and you know we slowly tease the clip in between the the, the neck of the aneurysm, and yeah, slowly release it. Okay, just to make things interesting for you, yeah. So that's how a clipped aneurysm looks like on the microscope. Okay, this is another one, an ICA PCOM aneurysm. Immediate post-op picture, you can see in the CTA, it's an inferior projecting aneurysm. Yeah, and so you see, this is quite a swollen brain, so we have to use a retractor on it, uh, and I have to use a long clip. Sorry for the music, yeah, sounds okay, but uh, essentially, you know, this is around the skull base, so you see, there's a lot of bone occluding the way. Zoom with Rosy and clip is on. So you have to do it slowly and gently. All right. Okay. Now this is a lady with an MCA aneurysm. She was found unconscious at home. Husband was working in China. She came in. Luckily, she was well. I clipped her, and I mean she's recovered very well, except for some concerns because she's uh, her. Uh, there's a bit of asymmetry over her her forehead. So you know the story is not it's not always bad. It's fairly good a lot of times. Okay, but there are times when things go bad when diagnoses are not picked up or you know delayed. This 68-year-old lady was referred to me. I mean, she had a history of infective endocarditis with uh, CCF. She was having 10 days history of recurrent headaches. Uh, not really investigated. She was treated in another hospital and transferred in to me on. Uh, I mean, suddenly the GCS dropped to six on request because there was, um, you know, a neurosurgeon there was. Uh, Not comfortable to treat this patient. So, if you notice, there's bilateral diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage and multiple clots. So, in a case like this, huh, with IE, we always think of an infective uh, mycotic aneurysm. And you see, in this CT angio, there's bilateral huge aneurysms and bilateral bleeds. So, you no, know, and you can see on the CT scan, there's clots both sides. So, I had to actually operate on both of these, you know, to sort them out. So, it was quite uh, a difficult surgery. So, bad GCS, you know, and Here you can see the brain is already ischemic with a lot of clots there. I just managed to get to the base of the aneurysm and clip the the bigger one. And here the second video down here is the second aneurysm that I had to clip in one setting. And you can see there's so much blood that the brain has lost a lot of its beautiful. I mean, its normal appearance. You know, a lot of marsh and all these things. You know, when we clip it. And. Okay, so essentially, this was not a very good case. Patient developed severe vasospasm uh, around two weeks post-op, and she died. So, thing is, when you have such a severe case, you know sometimes things always don't go well, especially in a delayed diagnosis. So, yeah, this is sometimes we try, but we don't. We still don't always succeed. 
Now, other than clipping, endovascular coiling is a very good way to secure an aneurysm, but it's not always for every different type of aneurysm. But what has essentially happens is you place a coil, a detachable coil inside the aneurysm and cause it to thrombose. So you're still able to maintain flow through the artery. Uh, so the coil is inserted like this. This graphic shows it. And you pack the, the coil into the aneurysm dome and eventually it clots off. Sometimes, um, See, not every aneurysm is successfully I mean, okay for coiling because if the neck is very large, then you, the coil will not sit inside, right? So in those kind of cases, sometimes we can even do, do something called stent assisted or flow, I mean, coiling or flow diverting coiling. This is a new uh, device, which just basically you put a stent through the aneurysm and blood will flow through the stent and, you know, not go through into the aneurysm so much. Eventually the aneurysm will thrombose off. So these are some, you know, in endovascular approaches. So here, this is a more technical picture. Like, you know, we, we pass a fine endovascular catheter, then the, the flow diverter goes through. After some time, after about six months, one year, you'll find it, it would have thrombosed off. So, okay, sometimes none of this is possible. Uh, and we have to bypass the aneurysm because of its shape. But if you just, if you just trap the aneurysm, uh, you're going to have ischemia on the distal end. So that's where we do uh, we aneurysm trapping and we bypass. So, you know, we, you can, a common bypass is done is from the, uh, you know, superficial temporal artery from the external carotid artery to the middle cerebral artery. So this augments flow through the middle cerebral artery. Here's an example of how it will look like, you know, the graft is from here. We harvest the superficial temporal artery and we graft it to the middle cerebral artery, right? Then you trap off the aneurysm in here. So this picture is a large aneurysm, you know, fusiform, you can't clip this, there's no proper neck. So that's why these are cases we sometimes bypass, right? So that is some of the strategies or treatment approach to sort the aneurysm out. Uh, a small word on cerebral vasospasm. I said one of the most feared and difficult to treat complications of SAH is spasm. Even if you take out the clot, you drain the hydrocephalus, uh, if, if you clip nicely or you call nicely, they can still get this. And it typically occurs from day three up to day 14, stretching even up to three weeks. Of course, the first one week is the worst. Lah. So how do we predict this? Uh, there's something called the fissure grading. In the initial CT itself, how much blood is seen on the CT scan and how thick the layers are can help predict. And those with, within category three with thick clots at the base, there's a 95% chance of uh, angiographic vasospasm. So here's an example. This is fissure grade one. You don't see any blood. Fissure two, the thin blood, thin diffuse SAH, less than one millimeter in thickness with no clots. Here's issue three, uh, you know, the one I mentioned with the highest vasospasm risk. And of course, if there's IVH or there's a parenchymal clot, uh, it's a grade four, but grade three is the one with the highest vasospasm risk because there's the most amount of blood in the cisterns and the cisterns is where the cerebral blood vessels are located. Newer things that we start doing now, we can do cerebral perfusion studies, you know, to show the mean transit time, the time, you know, time to peak and all gives you a better guide on spasm and how well are you, you know, your BP thresholds, are you treating them adequately? You know, do you need to do anything further? So once you've secured, I mean, we will monitor patients with TCD as well as, you know, sometimes and necessary, we can do CT perfusion. If there's vasospasm, we treat it medically. And sometimes we send them to the endovascular intervention for, you know, balloon assisted dilatation and drug injections. Okay, so this is basically what is done. Okay, beyond that, multi-system effects of uh, SAH, I did mention earlier, you know, the, all the, mul the way it can affect. Okay, so a little touch on unruptured aneurysm. Sometimes you find an aneurysm in a location on an incidental finding, you know, or it's uh, another on the opposite side to a known aneurysm. So we decide whether to intervene based on the size of the aneurysm and the location. Uh, and there's the, something called the FACES score that we use based on your, which population you're from, whether you're hypertensive, your age, aneurysm size, prior bleed, and based on this, we decide whether to intervene or not, okay? So the follow-up for these are usually, we will just repeat imaging over a year, make sure that the risk factors are controlled. And if there's any suspicious symptomatology, of course, immediately investigate. Lah. Okay, one of the mimickers of SAH from an aneurysm is known as a perimesencephalic non-aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'm choosing this one to highlight because it will present very similarly as an aneurysm rupture, sudden severe headache. When you do an NGO, the NGO is negative. When you do a CT scan, there will be blood in the basal systems, you know, where the blood uh, vessels are located. Now, the good thing about this is its clinical cause is not as severe. The outcome is not as bad. But you have to ensure that you do enough number of imaging, particularly NGOs, you know, serially to make sure that you don't 
miss uh, you know aneurysm because it's partially thrombosed or that particular vessel is uh, you know and uh, uh, what do you call it uh, spastic vessel spastic at that point in time so just something to know uh, the, these days you know we have there were a lot of new things to improve uh, aneurysm clipping we can do uh, intraoperative angiography this is one of the first cases done in USM quite a few years ago uh, my case of my anterior communicating artery aneurysm and we've also gone on to doing awake brain surgery for aneurysms because when there's you know you overclip an aneurysm and they end up you know not getting enough perfusion in the main parent vessel we can actually adjust the clip position okay so i'm just this is my overview for today uh, i just like to conclude by saying that you know we all know that aneurysms are potentially life threatening conditions there have been a lot of advances in surgical and you know endovascular therapy that actually improve patient safety and outcome but early detection and initiation of treatment is of course vital i think we have we have all agreed on that all right so uh, and and the risk factor control is uh, is uh, along the way so with that i thank you thank you mr aguna um any questions so far in the chat no maybe i'll, I'll start the ball rolling so uh, i think you mentioned just now about uh called the subarachnoid hemorrhage and they called the risk of vasospasm uh in interact two i think they did they didn't really specify to to i don't i don't think so they preferred the sah as as one of the yes. as a, one of the the the, the, the sub type of hemorrhage so don't do do don't do the same for, for sah patient so uh yeah reduction of uh, blood pressure but in fact yeah from my point of view so we have a lots of intracranial atherosclerotic disease so uh, sometimes we have concurrent aneurysm and i i can we call it when you do the intract two style uh, immediately the blood pressure reduction to 140 and 90 below uh, they had a ischemic stroke together with it <laughs> so, exactly so, yeah. so that can happen because of we are asia and we have icats so so do, but um, going to a question so uh, uh, maybe the first one is a uh, few question here so how frequently you do do you uh, practice tcd as one of your monitoring uh, regularly yeah now especially you have access now in private so uh, i had access in usm even more than in private to be very honest all, uh, okay, okay. so yeah yeah so good in okay. usm that yeah so that's yeah, number okay. one First, to answer this question <laughs> i'll start with that then i'll move on to the the next question now vasospasm there are two types there's radiological or and there's clinical all right now uh, just say 60% of patients will have radiological vasospasm but out of that 60% only half that means only 30% will have clinical vasospasm it is the clinical vasospasm that needs to be treated so when you monitor a patient for spasm it is a combination of radiology and clinical features i, I won't say that one is superior to another and uh, what i found with practice i mean we have something called the linden guard ratio the mca to ica velocity we have the absolute velocity of the mca absolute velocity but i will tell you this it is also a bit operator dependent right on the angles and all these things so what i used to practice is when the patient comes in i straight away on baseline i'll get one tcd all right then i will repeat the tcd especially the first one week and i treat not just absolute values but also i mean i look at not just absolute values but also changes in trend now while i'm doing that i also start uh, you know very vigilantly monitoring for any subtle neurological deficit see sometimes when you see the aneurysm patient in the icu awake you won't really go and ask them angka tangan do this. i mean you don't really test neurologically strictly that, that is the reality lah i mean you know I, I, and sometimes resident like, okay okay i do this okay uh, syndrome you know <laughs> only when the consultant comes everything comes out so yes you have to when you realize there's already vasus spasm you have to be watching because changes can happen very fast and you rule you make sure you correct other things that can uh, cloud your assessment like make sure anti epileptics are there correct electrolyte imbalances sodium abnormality very common you know post sah so you you clear all these things if there is an evd you make sure it's functioning because if you let icp to go up and you already see the tcd velocity is going up that is actually disastrous for the patient so this is the neurocritical care aspects that we are looking at but true if there is combination of doppler and a deterioration i mean a doppler findings and a deterioration consciousness with all this ruled out then you are you are quite strongly know that okay it's likely spasm we will do the first the triple h therapy but there's a lot of okay lah there's a lot of controversy on triple h because pushing the bp too high you get a cardiac dysfunction 
right? And and that's where okay. If and if it doesn't work, you just don't uh, buggy and wait lah. <laughs> After a certain threshold, with endovascular available, we go in for drug injections. We go in for balloon and uh, that is one thing which I have to say. Fortunately, in private, it's been very help here. Easy. If I have a problem, they don't wake up. I mean, they are, they are deteriorating. They're not improving. I do a scan. There's no reversible cause. I mean, no other bleed or hydrocephalus or whatever going on. I can actually send the patient down. They put in a sheath and they inject. Usually, it has to be repeated. Like it's not a one-off. You know, you have to you keep the sheath there three days, four days. You just keep injecting the drug until you know the vessels dilate. Yeah. So that's so TCD definitely has a role if it's available, but don't. It's not like TCD is the only thing. And then now we have CT perfusion, which also gives you quite a bit of information. All right. So next part of the question. Yeah. So, so I think yeah, to call, uh, yeah, you was touching about CT perfusion. I was trained for that in Royal Melbourne. Ah. So, but um, so for the CT perfusion, um, yeah, uh, the problem is, uh, yeah, because of we playing around with a bit of contrast. Sometimes my 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 caution is basically if you have concurrent like what you say just now, reversible thing. For example, AKI, uh, urine output is not so good. Um, yeah, another one thing, a neurologist that usually I had a referral recently uh, is basically the rare circumstances of contrast induced encephalopathy. And you have a, your colleague yeah. uh, uh, from interventional doing a called uh, angiogram that further worsen the patient condition in terms of the, the, the agree, cerebral agree. function. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically having a TCD, I think, is very relevant. Um, yeah, yeah, but I, I, I really, really appreciate that you, uh, you agree that uh, clinical class TCD is very, very important. So, uh, and maybe uh, my last question uh, might be before we move to the other one. So I think I have a lot, but the second one, I, I encounter a few patients that basically referred to us uh, after SAH, then they develop this uh, hydrocephalus as a sequelae mm -hmm. of the, 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 the subrun hemorrhage. So uh, do you have any advice or, on how do, do we really help this patient because of some of them when they discharge right so they they don't know what are the the sequelae so patient discharge home gcs acceptable so obeying command a bit um, but so, call a few weeks after they develop called deterioration of gcs and they come to us and obviously there's hydrocephalus as a sequelae when when is the time that you anticipate they will happen this will happen and number two is uh, what are the modalities of management afterwards that may help the patient? Okay, this is a very good question. Okay, baseline. In any subarachnoid hemorrhage, 30% of patients will require a permanent CSF drainage method. Bottom line. So 3 out of 10 is going to happen. But hydrocephalus is way more common. In the initial management, we most of the time we'll put an external ventricular drain, you know, especially to, to relieve the pressure and to drain out. Now, normally the, the, the dictum is you keep the EVD in for at least about 10 days, two weeks, you let it drain out slowly. And based on the CSF production trends, output, you know, you challenge the thing slowly and you take it out. But then invariably, sometimes uh, patients do develop uh, delayed uh, deterioration. Either there's a change in the consciousness or they have a cranectomy, it starts bulging out. So um, what, I mean, when you have, whenever there's a neurological change, whether it's early or late, you have to do a repeat imaging. And by and large, if it's due to hydrocephalus from a, you know, reabsorptive hydrocephalus, um, it's communicating in nature. So in the hospital setting, sometimes there are some tricks I used to use. I hope we are being recorded, but I get the, I do a daily or EOD LP. I get my, I get the least trained resident to do it. Why? Because there are multiple puncture attempts. You penetrate the dura, there will be a small pocket of CSF draining. Uh, you know, it'll collect in the lumbar sub, sub, soft tissue and sometimes invariably it will, uh, it will sort itself out, right? Versus keeping another EVD there, infection and so on and so forth. Now, but if it's a very delayed manifestation, you know, after some time, then he needs a VP shunt. I mean, they, I think it's about telling the patient that yes, hydrocephalus can occur. You know, it can occur. 30% we will need permanent diversion. Sometimes it occurs acutely and you'll be fine. Sometimes you can come in later. So if you start having worsening headaches, the headaches are not becoming less and less. Worsening headache, uh, sudden blurring of vision, all these features, you know, or change in uh, behavior, it is definitely warrants a CT scan and, and a shunt. I think this is a lot to do with the neurosurgical care, how you counsel the patient, you explain, but you must have these numbers in your brain that 
this can happen. Uh, Mr. Ragu, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just you. a little bit modification by Mr. Ashraf, Dr. Ashraf's question. Uh, we had a similar type of question which they may present to ED at the DCS mm -hmm. of a 14 or 13 at the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. they just say the patient's a young age, sudden onset of a headache with a drowsiness. So while we are planning to do a CT and patient proceed with the DGCS suddenly dropped to 10. Mm. Listen, the time period is just about half an hour to an hour, you know. I'm just asking, is there any role of elective intubation for this group of patients? Because at the end, it's the cerebral protection matters for this group of patients, right? So maybe at the beginning, DGCS is about 12 to 13. And then it suddenly dropped to 10. A matter of time, but is there a way if we could anticipate early in this group of patients, is there any way to identify without the CT is there, like just uh, history or examination? The thing is, uh, there are a lot of things, reasons why a patient could suddenly consciousness. It could be from a, it could be a seizure, it could be some infection, it could be an electrolyte imbalance. So, I to give you a uniform answer to this, it's a little difficult la, for me. I mean, to tell you that, you know, I think, uh, sorry, my internet connection is a bit unstable, but yeah, I think uh, go down to quick assessment and just do a scan. They've got all this history of this problem, that problem. Just get a scan done. If the GCS is 13, I think there's a role for monitoring first. Lab, because you don't know what you're dealing with. Of course, hindsight, everybody can come and comment, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. But I think we, like that we will start intubating everybody, right? And, and intubation is not without its complications. And we are working in a resource uh, limited, even though people will not admit it, we are working in a resource limited environment. So on one side, yes, we want to do, but I think uh, we have to balance it out. Yeah. Um, if you know that the patient got all this rocky history sometimes, uh, and you really think that there's lateralizing signs, race ICPP. Yeah. Acceptable. But the problem is just say they have a seizure. And then for temporarily, the GCF draw to 10 and they wake up and you intubate the patient Sometimes you're going to cause more problems for the patient. So that's why uh, for me to be able to give you this statement, hydrocephalus is just one of the things that could cause it. Uh, why the deterioration can be so rapid? You know, there's this thing called the brain compliance curve. At the lower end, uh, the brain will compensate, compensate, compensate. But when you come to that decompensated point, uh, deterioration can be so yeah. This was my personal experience where we, uh, my MO saw the patient in yellow. My half an hour with arrival GCS was just about 13. Went to CT, came back, GCS dropped 10. Repeated CT, there was a massive hydrocephalus. Mm. Together with a midline shift and we lost the patient. Because of now anyway, there's uh, Mr. Sindhil there, my former student. He's oh. now in Subaran Jaya. I'm sure he's very approachable, easily. He will be happy to help you out in any way. Yeah? Um, uh, so. <laughs> At least now that you have neurological uh, son there in some branch, I mean, it's very unfortunate. La. And uh, I think uh, there are some subtle signs sometimes. As I said, if you had somebody had looked at the fundus, sometimes you might have picked up a edema. But I know it's very easy to comment in a retrospective manner. I think we just, as long as we learn from it and we don't, we try to prevent it in the future, that's, that's the best I think we can all do. La. Thank you, Mr. Uh, totally agree. And I think the, there's a question by uh, Dr. Istrot here. Uh, but also traumatic uh, uh, SAH. Uh, maybe Mr. Regu can, can share with us in terms of uh, the different approach if there is uh, in, briefly about uh, traumatic SAH as Mr. Regu mentioned in the initial part. SAH is broad and there's a lecture like maybe a week huh? or more than that. We can, we can go for a holiday symposium. <laughs> holiday symposium yeah. <laughs> so maybe yeah, going for the traumatic, uh, yeah. so the, the Istra is also eager to know just a bit of brief one. If possible, if not, then can, uh, we, can, no problem. Yeah. yeah. So traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, typically, uh, I mean, after a traumatic event, you when you see it, it's usually on the cortical surface. Mm. It's not so much within deep seated, there will be an associated cerebral contusion in typical situation. Uh, the main uh, risk of vasospasm is way much lower because the blood is only around the cortical surface rather than deep within where the main blood vessels are. My concern when I see SAH is seizures. I mean, some form of cortical irritation, I would, anti-epileptics, okay, uh, a little bit off the <laughs> typical guideline, but I would definitely put the picture of anti-epileptic uh, post-trauma. <clears throat> Sometimes, uh, um, you can have an MV after having an aneurysm. This happened to my guru discipline or HE, Hal Ewal Plajas of my school, and I was working in neurosurgery by that time. So, you know, can you imagine she's shocked? <laughs> so, he was driving a car, he, I mean, his, his wife's shocked, he, and he drove into a tree. 
So everybody thought it's MBA, MBA, MBA. But there was so diffuse and thick sambar agno and hemorrhage with the basal systems. Now in that kind of situation, uh, um, you know, it, sometimes it, you have to use your clinical judgment to do a, go ahead and just do a CTA. You would be surprised. The patient finally ended up having an aneurysm. But by and large, traumatic SH, cortical surface, associated injury, you know, it's along the, the, the trajectory of the, the trauma impact, you know, coup or contra coup. I think uh, it's less ominous compared to, you know, the proper, uh, this one, lah, the severe aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, to, to put it very simply. Lah. Thank you, Mr. Rigo. Uh, I think, yeah, because of time, I think we also need to uh, call, ask this question. I think this must be uh, from This is one of my residents, currently yeah. a neurosurgeon in Sabah. Yes. Yeah, from neurosurgery. From him. So, yeah, Mr. Ramesh, yeah, so basically asking about what or your opinion on routine lamina terminalis fenestration during aneurysmal surgery. Changi is your So, <laughs> this question is a surgical step. Sometimes we open up part of the floor of the third ventricle in order to, during the surgery, when we're going to clip the aneurysm, alang alang, we are there, we do it, so that to help to communicate the ventricle with the subarachnoid space, because they, there was a, a earlier tenet that said that it reduces uh, the incidence of hydrocephalus requiring permanent diversion. Uh, yes, I used to do it. I would still say sometimes I do do it, but I know that uh, the, the literature on it is not absolutely 100% supportive. Lah. Uh, I don't think it causes much damage if you do it. It's a quick step, extra step. Uh, but, you know, of course, if placed before an audience of discerning EBM people, I would, uh, I probably have to say that the evidence is not so strong in terms of its prevention of hydrocephalus. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Regu. So, I have one question. Yeah, one question, yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Regu, what's your take about IV transcendent acid in uh, non traumatic SAH? I'm sure there's some role. Uh, I think there were some earlier papers, you know, that had a, uh, some positive evidence from what we are seeing from, I mean, all this crash and all this. I think there's definitely some role, but my, I would still want to test it against a large data. You know why? You have spasm going on. You give a prothrombotic condition. Sometimes you're going to cause an ischemic infarct. So uh, I would not jump to use it just yet unless it really, you know, go puts through the put through the the, the measure lah. Then the argument to that is okay. Spasm usually happens after day three, you know. So there are some scientific pros and cons on this matter, but I think the evidence is such uh, cool, at mm. this point. Man. All right, thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Agu. Thank you. Uh, call, uh, I I learned a lot, uh, and yeah. Uh, call the question from Dr. Nasrina about the uh, transmit acid. I think few of us or majority of us here, uh, at least the, uh, from emergency uh, fraternity and neurology will launch the next uh, ICH uh, TIC3 study mm. where it will go as fast as possible if possible <laughs> as fast as possible in certain country it go from the ambulance itself mm -hmm. uh, so to, to, to really give transmit acid but I think Going to ICH is really multidisciplinary, like what we are now handling in, in, in ischemic stroke, uh, where you need to really fast with your emergency click. Uh, and in ICH in particular, even in ischemic stroke, uh, we need the neurosurgeon to be really standby at the back. Uh, and the call, it is very fast that we will pass over, for example, ischemic stroke. We, we go for hemiconectomy. Maybe one day we can discuss about hemiconectomy again. And uh, for ICH specifically, uh, we need to be very fast and fail medical therapy where we cannot uh, called, uh, avoid the expansion of hematoma or in SAH. Uh, very, very much, uh, we, we need to, to work together with the, all the teams. Yeah? So I think uh, um, any last question? Yeah, because of we, we really yeah, learned quite a lot. I, I, I really call, appreciate your sharing today. Very good. Uh, no other question in the chat. If not, then I'll pass back to Dr. Nasrina to share okay. if we have any message for the next one. Okay, <laughs> I'm you. just going to stop recording first.